for another Vaughan boundary. <laughs> well, he's a great fieldsman, Philip Tuffner. He often falls over and he's brought it into his batting as well. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vaughan and Tuffers Cricket Club podcast brought to you by The Telegraph. Ben, Mike and Nick Holt with you this week, reflecting on the fifth and final test of an incredible summer of Ashes cricket. Australia had already retained the urn heading into the final test, but England won at the Oval to level 2-2, a fitting end to a thrilling Ashes series that had it all from first ball to last. And we got a fairy tale ending for Stuart Broad, who departed cricket taking a wicket with his very last ball. We'll reflect on Broad's career, his decision to retire, and whether his best mate, Jimmy Anderson, will remain in the England setup without him. Zach Crawley was one of England's standout players over the series, and I'm delighted to say that he'll be joining us today. He's been speaking with Michael in the aftermath of England's victory. And with the dust now settled on this series, we'll look ahead to the World Cup, England's next tour in India, and what we can expect to see from Stokes and McCullum in the winter. Morning, Mike. Morning, Nick. Uh, an incredible end to an incredible series. Uh, what did you make of that last test? It was it was a roller coaster. Had a bit of everything: great batting, great bowling, a bit of weather. It was kind of a bit like the uh, the whole series in in microcosm, wasn't it, Mike? Yeah, I mean it's um, it's been an incredible five matches. Um, you know, there's not one game. I guess Manchester with the rain um, that disappointed, but. The three and a, a bit days of uh, cricket that we saw at Manchester were, were fantastic. So it, it's been the best series that I've seen um, in, in terms of uh, watching and, and broadcasting in the game. It's just had absolutely everything. It's just had drama, uh, controversy, brilliance, rubbish at times. Uh, the rain's nipped in. There's been ball change. I mean, I have to say the ball change that England got at the Oval was genius. I've no idea how they got that newer ball at <laughs> 37 overs when uh, the Aussies were dominating. Um, so it's just had a little bit of everything. It's had drop catches, it's had catches that were taken and then deemed not to be taken. Uh, it's had a ruckus in the, the long room at Lords. Not seen that before. Um, yeah, th- there's nothing that this test series has, hasn't had. And I just think it's been a great, um, just a great advert for, for the longer format. I mean, it's a, it, it's a format that is kind of competing with all these franchise leagues around the world and there's a lot of players that are younger to kind of just moving towards the, the white ball franchise model. I understand that, but I just hope that uh, a lot of those players uh, and younger players now are watching what this uh, England side and, and Australian side have delivered in the last seven weeks, surely you want to be a part of something like that in the future. You know, I felt yeah. very old actually yesterday when I was interviewing Ben Stokes afterwards and he looked at me and he said, when I was a young whippersnapper, in 2005 I thought oh my god I'm so old now (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I I was inspired to go on and play because of that series and oh this series will certainly have uh, inspired many many more uh, young young boys and girls to get the bats in the garden and try and in 10-15 years time try and emulate this series it was absolutely fantastic yeah well you, you say it had everything well the one thing it didn't have was a definitive result but Nick, do you, yeah, think, do, you, do you think two all is a fair result? Not really, no. I think it's the most one-sided two all of all time. <laughs> I, I can't, England, you know, if this was a points decision, they, it'd be unanimous, surely. Um, and, uh, and if it wasn't for the rain in Manchester, you know, Australia would be going home, the team that suffered the well, wrong end of the greatest Ashes comeback of all time. Um, uh, it, was, it was just... Brilliant sport, wasn't it? It, it, it? There are not many things in life these days that that, that can that that match live sport for giving you the unknown, and that's what every match did. It was tense all the way through, from Zach Crawley cracking the first ball for four to Stuart Broad taking a wicket with the last ball of the series. It was just brilliant entertainment. I, I, I actually found yesterday agonising. I had to I had to see an emergency dentist during the Old Trafford test. And honestly, that was less painful than watching yesterday because, <laughs> because it, it was so tense all the way through. Even when Murphy and, and Carey were batting at the end, you were thinking, could they do it? I mean, it's that kind of series. Perhaps, they, perhaps they, there's one last twist. Um, but then, of course, Broad comes up and delivers a perfect finale. 
Yeah, but Halsey, Halsey, uh, don't give me the emotional spiel of how you were a roller coaster yesterday. The only reason you're a roller coaster in emotions is because you, you're writing a book on the Basball Revolution. And if Australia had won 3 1, your book was going crashing off the shelves. No one was <laughs> <Yeah>. buying it. <laughs> I, I, I think as, uh, as Smith and Labuschagne were batting in the second innings, uh, headingly, that book was heading for the pulpers, I think. Um, but, uh, yeah, and, and, the, and the title has changed several times over the last couple of weeks. But uh, writing a book in real time when you don't actually know the ending uh, is not something I recommend. Uh, i tell you what, Ben, Ben, there is something that this series hasn't had, uh, a run out. Really? That's a good point. It's not, it's not had a run out. Uh, and uh, headingly for the first time in Test Match cricket history, uh, there wasn't a three. <laughs> really? So it's not had a three in a Test Match uh, for the first time ever, and it's not had a run out. So it, it can't be the greatest series of all time. You've got to have a run out, and you've got to have threes in every Test Match. Well, Smith was near as damn it run out, wasn't he? Yeah, and, and that shows that third umpires just have no sense of romance. So what, what do you think, Mike? 2-2 two, two fair, or do, do you agree with Nick that uh, a points victory for, for England? Oh, it's, it's, it's the outcome, isn't it? Over five matches, that's what it's ended up. But oh, I, reckon, I reckon if it was a boxing bout, um, I reckon the trainer's throwing the towel in after about the eighth. <laughs> it, 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 England pummeled them, honestly. I... I've, I've, you know, we've criticised England rightfully in, in the, the early stages of the, the series. They made some glaring mistakes, which cost them uh, that first test match at uh, Edgebaston. They should never have lost that game. Mm-hmm. They should never have come close to losing that game. Uh, but it's the way that they play. And then at Lords, that first innings batting and the bowling on day one, that's cost them. Uh, but to think that they've found the mentality to come back from two, and as, as Holt has said, I mean, if they'd have won in Manchester and they would if the rain hadn't have uh, fallen, it would have been the greatest ever. You know, you don't yeah. come back. I mean, when the, the, the series, was it 32, Nick, when 1932, 36. when they came back, yeah, when Bradman was in the side, but it was then, that was timeless tests. Yeah. You know, to come back from 2 0 down in this era where you're only playing 81, 82 overs a day and there is rain in the UK would have been remarkable. But uh, like I put in my column today that I honestly think that Stokes will go down as the greatest eventually, if not, because. It's not always, um, as an England captain, what you do on the field. It, yeah, it, you need to win. You need to win games, and he's win, won plenty of them. But it's more about the legacy that you create. And and in an era, and, and this is in, in no, 2005 and, you know, in the 80s when Brearley was captain, um, Test cricket was the pinnacle because white ball revolution hadn't really been created. Mm. Whereas what Ben Stokes is trying to achieve, is he's trying to rip up the... Not, the franchise model is going to be around for a long period. It's going to make players a lot of money, but he's desperately trying to save and help Test Match Cricket in 10 or 15 years' time become a better product. And if the world of cricket buys into, and I don't think you have to buy into basball, I just think the world of Test Match Cricket needs to buy into the the win, you know, trying to win games, you know, and trying always to get on the front foot and um, play positive cricket. And if everyone buys into that, I think Test Match Cricket is going to be in a better place. And in 10 or 15, 20 years, I think we'll always be talking about Ben Stokes being the leader and Baz McCullum that joined together and created a partnership that did a great service for the game. Not just for English cricket, because we're loving it and the England fans, they've got a cult following. They've got a a new audience that um, are following. I always feel you judge uh, an England Test Match series on the celebrities that suddenly start arriving to to watch the England <laughs> side, and yeah. there was there was there was there was Hollywood stars, rock stars, you name it. There were footballers, rugby players. Everyone was at the Oval this week, um, and there's been so many people that have contacted me to, to say that their kids have got into cricket because of the way that uh, this England side are playing. So I, I do think in time he'll go down as the greatest because he doesn't just deliver as a captain, uh, he delivers as a player as well. He's the best at dealing with the pressure. Yeah, I was going to ask whether you thought that the series had permeated and it got to the outside world and had won us new fans. You obviously clearly think that, Mm. Mike. I mean, mean, we're in a sort of bubble watching it. We're kind of fans already. Nick, do you get the impression that the wider world is sitting up and taking notice? I think if you watch newspaper col- read newspaper columns over the next couple of days, you can see the word basball mentioned a lot outside of the sports pages. Uh, you'll see business. Yeah. You've already written a piece of the Telegraph, Ben, on, on the business world and looking at, at, at some of the basball principles. Uh, I read a piece early in Independence saying it could be applied to politics. Look, it's going it, to, it, it's definitely uh, spread outside of cricket and, and 
other sports teams want to know what's going on. How does basketball apply to politics? Go in there spraying all sorts of shots? <laughs> well, I think it, it's probably it's probably being honest to yourself that, that and, and sticking to your principles uh, under pressure, which is exactly what they did when they were 2-0 down because that was the strength of leadership, really, because that was the moment when they could yeah. have blinked. But actually, they doubled mm. down on it and they scored quicker in the last two test matches um, and, and, and blew us straight away. We've been on Ashes tours, Mike, and you've seen England go 2 0 down, and all of a sudden they're turning on each other, and you know, you know it's only going to end one way. But this time, it galvanised them, really. Yeah, but I, I think that the, the reason why they could do that is that those two first games, they were so close to winning both of them. You know, when, you, when you've come close to winning an op to, uh, against someone, you, you know you're close. You've just got to tinker and win certain elements of the game that little bit better. Um, I'll mention Mark Wood's uh, impact with the bat at Headingley. Because mm. at 180 for seven, was it? When he strolled out there and suddenly started hitting those sixes, that created a huge amount of momentum and it gave Ben Stokes a little bit of leeway at the other end just to settle in. And then England got to a, a decent first in his total. Um, without that Mark Wood, and it was just after lunch, you know, Wokes had just been out playing the pull shot. It was just after lunch. He went in the indoor school, came out, I think he was playing baseball with Paul Collingwood in the indoor school, uh, came out after lunch and hit those six, and then suddenly things started to, to change in terms of the momentum. Uh, they were so close to losing that game at Headingley. So, so close to losing. And, you know, to, to, to have the mental strength and the, the dressing room culture to get you over the line in those uh, tight games, the must-win games, uh, that's all about the leadership. It's all about what, what messaging is coming from the captain, the coach, the other coaches, um, you know, and you, you hear so many of the players talk about this leadership group and what they've done for, the, for them as people. You know, I, I always think if you're a, a leader in sport, you can lead people in other forms of life. And, you know, I, I, I've, I've spoke to quite a number of these England players and they, they, they are absolutely loving this new mindset. It's like a, a breath of fresh air to wake up every morning and be positive. You know, if you, if you, if you decided to wake up every morning and go, do you know what? I'm not going to think about what happened yesterday because I can't change it. It's all about being positive today. How can you impact today and these hours that are ahead of me rather than thinking about what happened yesterday? And we all have it where we're all thinking about what happened last week, three months ago, two years ago. And your mind just kind of gets eaten away with negativity because you're actually thinking about things that's happened and, and been gone. You know, you can't do anything about that. Whereas this England mindset is purely about what they can impact going forward. From this moment on, what can you do to impact the game? Uh, positivity around the dressing room and positivity in life. And uh, it's working brilliantly. You mentioned uh, Wood and Wokesy. Uh, I think I saw Wood being uh, interviewed afterwards and he said, uh, yeah, me and Wokesy have come in and won 2-0. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> And it, I mean, they did. I mean, you, you mentioned Wood with the bat. I mean, that first spell with the ball was absolutely electric, totally box office. But Wokes really has been absolutely sensational. He's got 19 wickets at 18.1. Obviously, only played three matches, but was man of the match in this 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 test at the Oval and named player of the series after only playing three tests. I mean, we talked about some of the mistakes England have made through the series. Not picking him for laws must rank up there. That's where he's got a got the best track record. Yeah, I guess so. Um, you know, I, I, like, he, he has been high class with the Duke ball for many, many years. You know, it shouldn't surprise us that he, he suddenly has impact with the Duke ball in English conditions because that is what he does. He does that in Test match cricket. Um, I, I would say the selectors were probably quite nervous yesterday. <laughs> you know, I, I would say that the likes of Luke Wright, Rob Key have made this call to stick with Jimmy Anderson, who's you know, he's just had no impact. Jimmy's tried his best. I thought he bowled okay at the Oval. He had a, a little bit of unfortune, but I think the selection group will probably think, probably like you in your book, Holty, they were probably mid-afternoon thinking, oh no, oh no, Jimmy. And, and particularly yesterday when it was doing plenty and Jimmy came on to bowl and suddenly the ball started to travel around. And I think everyone was watching going, oh no, because this could get, you know, not, oh, it was never going to get ugly because England have played too much good cricket over the course of the last seven weeks. But, um, they would certainly have been questioned a lot more than they are going to get now. They've won that game about staying very, very loyal to what now is a 41-year-old. Um, particularly when you see Wokes doing what he did with mm. the ball. He was getting zip and movement and just that kind of carry through to Bairstow. That spell after the rain break in the afternoon 
when he came out with an old, what was it, 70 over old ball. It was probably a 50 over old ball because yeah. they got a good change, but he still got more more movement and more zip out of the service, surface than, than any, any other England bowler. Uh, and that's why he won every award. He was, uh, he was the difference. And that's why England have got the 2-2 in the series. Yeah, yeah. Nick, do you, do you think he should have played at Lords? Uh, I don't think he should have played at Lords. Uh, no, I think they held him back long, the right length of time. I'm not. I think he was uh, certainly ready to go when they picked him at Headingley. Uh, whether he was still working on his fitness and building that up because he hadn't played Test cricket for over a year. He'd had a very serious knee injury, and when he played for Warwickshire earlier in the season, he didn't look at look the same bowler. Um, so I think being around the group and going back to county cricket for a little bit during that period certainly helped. Um, but I, I remember we, we spoke to Ben Stokes in New Zealand and he said that his uh, uh, orders to the England medical staff were to give me eight fit fast bowlers. Well, he ended the series with the oldest Ashes attack since 1928 um, <laughs> and still managed to win both those test matches, which... You know, as Vaughan would know, that, that it, it was probably down to his captaincy as well, as much as anything, the way he, he managed those bowlers and the way he fashioned 20 wickets uh, at the Oval and probably would have done at Manchester had it not rained, uh, with his field changes, with his bowling changes and with just giving them belief all the way through. And, and that's despite, to be fair, carrying Jimmy, which sounds harsh, but he, he, he didn't. Yeah. He, but like, so he bowled well, he didn't have a lot of luck and he's uh, and, and, and he still has a role to play with this England team. But um, but they did it really without without any input from him. And, uh, and, and that's remarkable. Jimmy ended the series with the same amount of wickets as Joe Root. <laughs> and he only played... Um, one less test match, so that's. I would guess at a worse strike rate because because Joe didn't well, bowl that many overs. No, well, I don't know that, but Jimmy doesn't need you know reminding that it's not not been a great time. But I, I do think going forward that you know he has got something to offer. He, he will be around. He, he, you know, England need to make sure that they're they're looking after Jimmy in a way that you know can he can he play and also help out with the coaching. Whether he wants to do that or not, I'm not too sure. Can they use? Jimmy Anderson and you know England don't take play Test cricket till till February yeah. or end of Jan. You know, can Jimmy start to kind of work away into the system in terms of doing some coaching with the youngsters and you know to give give a forty one year old a year contract and it's a lot of money to potentially play four or five games. You know, it might be that they give him that, but he has to do some other work behind the scenes with with, with the younger bowlers uh, coming through the system. But you know, it, it's it's one of those series that. You know, there's always in Ashes series uh, the kind of point the finger at individuals because it's such a high profile series. But you look at Johnny Bairstow. Look at what Johnny Bairstow delivered in the last two weeks. He was under a huge amount of pressure after Headingley. No runs, drop catches. And then suddenly, I mean, he's produced two of the great catches to get rid of a, a real quality player in Mitchell Marsh in the last two games. The catch that he took yesterday off Moen Alley was a beauty. Yeah. An absolute beauty to 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 get rid of Mitchell Marsh. So you're always gonna you know you're always gonna talk about individual players, but um, you know I think as a whole it, it's hard for me to criticise when it's been so great for Test cricket and both sides. You've got two contrasting styles. I mean I do think that once the dust settles, I think Pat Cummins is going to have a lot more questions to answer than Ben Stokes. Okay, I was going to ask on that because um, just. Watching it on telly, the post-match interviews, you talked about it being a, a boxing contest. He did look a little punch drunk. Um, so you guys were on the ground. What was the mood amongst the Australians? Obviously, they get to celebrate with the urn, but I'm I'm guessing it wasn't high fives all round. Nick? Uh, well, in the press conference, Pat Cummins was pretty hollow-eyed, actually. He, he, he tried to... Uh, he tried to describe it as a great tour. He did describe it as a great tour for them, retaining the urn and becoming World Test champions. Um, but it felt a little bit forced, uh, if I'm honest. Um, mm. And I, 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 they looked a broken team probably by the end in the field, not necessarily on you know the, the fact that they fought so hard on day five uh, with a bat uh, shows us plenty of spirit there in that respect. But... I think that they go home having to examine some of their their preconceived ideas on Test cricket. Uh, Smith and Warner will go soon, um, and that leaves a big hole. I, I look at the Aussies; um, they'll be lying if they don't have a huge amount of regrets. 
This is an Australian group that drew 2-2 here in uh, 2019, where they were the better team. 2019, they were the best team by a mile. Didn't get the job done. They only drew. You know, they'll be thinking about those great Australian sides of the 90s, early 2000s that always got the job done here in the UK and back home in Australia. Uh, this group of Australian players won't do that. They haven't done it. You know, and when you tune a up and from being tune a up, I just felt that they played such a safe game. You know, it was crying out for them to just go for it. All they have to do is win one in three. Just go for it. And, you know, the safe nature of um, your mindset when you're playing in in such a, a safe, negative way, it backfires. You know, you end up having moments like we saw yesterday afternoon. You end up having those complete momentum shifts in the first innings. That second morning when Australia batted, yes, it swung, but... They tried nothing to put England's bowlers under pressure. They tried absolutely nothing. They didn't come down the wicket. They didn't try a shot or two. They were just purely playing for survival. And that is where Australia lost this game. They should have got 400 in the first innings. If they'd have got 400, I, I think they win that test match. And that pitch was playing well enough for the Aussies to go and get 400, 450, and they'd have won the Ashes. Same at Headley in the second innings. That was a... That was a 400 wicket in the second innings that uh, Australia batted on. It was flat. It wasn't doing a great deal. Uh, no spin for Moen Alley. Moen Alley picks up Lava Jane and Smith uh, in that innings. Um, so they've had an incredible amount of opportunity to win this series. And, and they're, they're lying if they don't get on that Qantas plane or wherever they're flying back with and sit back and go, oh, no, we, 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 we've missed a, a, a huge opportunity to join that great Australian era of the 90s, early 2000s of winning Ashes series here in the UK. And uh, we won't see many in the next series here. We, we'll, we might see a few in the, the series in a two and a half years' time in, in Australia, but they've all done that. They've all had that kind of moment of beating England in, in their own backyard. Uh, not many will be back here. How many years is it, Holtzy? Four and a half? Four years? Well, 2027, yeah. So four years. There won't, there won't be many. Uh, we were talking about individual performances, so uh, two words for you both. Stuart Broad, uh, I'm genuinely a little bereft that we've seen him bowl for the last time. Um, how surprised, first of all, were you that he had announced his retirement? Uh, I think t- surprised, yes. Uh, if you just said to me at the start of the series that he was going to announce his retirement in the last test, I wouldn't have been surprised, but I just wonder whether his performances had persuaded him that actually, oh, maybe I've got another year or two left in me. Um, So it came as a shock from that, from that point of view, given what he'd achieved in the series. Um, And we're going to miss so much about Broad. We're going to miss it. Obviously he's bowling, but he, but he's, his competitiveness, his ability to be a wind up merchant, his petulance sometimes, (laughs) you know, his ability to conjure great spells from nowhere. Um, and he talks so well about the game. Um, he's an original, original thinker. He's going to make a brilliant pundit. Um, so we're not going to lose him for long. He's going to be on our TV screens and we're going to be able to hear his thoughts on the game. Um, and what a way to finish. I mean, you could see him limbering up as uh, when they were eight down. Um, and I remember turning to one of our colleagues and saying, this is just classic Chris Wokes, isn't it? He's won this test match for England. You know who's going to come on and take the last two wickets and uh, steal the headlines away from him. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mike, you gave um, Stuart Broad his, his first cap 16 years ago, I think, was it? Is there a sort of spark in that young player that you could uh, you could detect? Yeah, yeah, I knew he was going to be, a, you know, I knew he was going to have a long England career. I didn't think he was going to get 600. And, what did he end up with, 604? Mm-hmm. I didn't think he was yeah. going to get, you know, that many wickets and 150 odd against Australia. But I knew he'd have a long career because he thought about the game uh, very well. He had skill. Uh, he's added to that skill incredibly over the 16 years. He's got that competitive edge. He always wants to win. I think that inner want to win is very important in a sports person. Uh, you've got to be desperate to get over the line at times. You, you could argue that Stuart might have crossed the line, but I'd rather have a sports person getting close to crossing the line than not. So I just think it's in you that you're desperate to go and win and that competitiveness that you have to have day in, day out to get up out of bed, train, uh, try and improve. You go through so many low moments in your career that um, I wasn't surprised this week. When it, when, it, when it was doing the rounds on Saturday, I thought, yeah, I, I kind of should have read it months ago because 
you know, you look at Stuart and what he is in terms of England versus Australia, you know he's not going to make two and a half years' time because, you know, he's been there and done that in Australia. And, and to do it at, at home, at the Oval, in front of a full house, all his family there, um, you know, it was the perfect time. And uh, I, I don't get emotional at all when players leave the game, particularly... Uh, players that have, have have done it in such a fairy tale way, it's it's such a an honour to be able to, to to see a player like Alistair Cook got that moment in 2018. There's only a small few in all sports around the globe that get the opportunity. So I just think they are incredibly skillful to get themselves into that fairy tale moment, and they deserve everything that comes their way because you know to work so hard for 16 years. And then to think that you've managed to hit your last ball for six against Australia at the Oval in front of a packed crowd. And then you get the last two wickets to win a test match against Australia. The nemesis, the old rival, the old rival that Stuart Broad has been prominent against for, for so many years. Um, it doesn't get any better than that. And, and, I, and Cookie in 18, that was some send off. But I think Broadie's, I, I think Broadie's surpassed it. Yeah, I think Brody said to Cookie, "Look, you did well in eighteen. I, I've, I've, I've done you. I've raised you. I've raised your hand. <laughs> it was, I mean, it, it was, was literally everything. It was to the left-handers. It was oh. round the wicket. It was angled in. It was moving away. Both the wickets. The penultimate one. He did the bail switch. So he, oh. as you said, Nick, the wind-up merchant. He got a last little wind-up in there. Yeah, and, uh, and and up to that point, he wasn't." Looking like taking a wicket, actually. I think he, I think it was the fifth ball of his third over that he did that just to change his luck. He kept beating the outside edge, but wasn't, uh, but wasn't getting close to the edge. And, and of course, then he, he did it. He took a wicket next ball. I mean, incredible. Um, I mean, Mike, Mike, does that actually bother you as a batsman? Somebody doing that? I mean, does it? I mean, do you care? I mean, you laugh? I, mean, what, what? I, 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 I love it because it's great. It's a great spectacle, and it worked twice. So. Um, I don't know who's going to carry on doing that for, for England in the future. I mean, if Brody had done that for the last 16 years, he could have ended up with a thousand test wickets. <laughs> so he's missed a trick there. Um, oh, it shouldn't, it shouldn't have. It's just, it just, it's the game, isn't it? It just happens. And, you know, when it's your last test match and, and you're, you're doing something very, very special, it almost was meant to be. Um, I did, I was laughing. I mean, cause, cause Cookie, he's been great on, on the radio with us this uh, last uh, few weeks. And I did turn to him and said, he's done you, he's done you. And he turned to me and goes, yeah, but if the rain hadn't come in Manchester, they'd have done the 05 series as well. But the, I said, but the rain did come. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I, I love the banter of, of moments. And, and you know, I, I just think in, in Stuart and, and Jimmy, that that's the, 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 the difficult thing for me is the broad Anderson partnership that's now been broken. You know, Jimmy going out to bowl. Where's that first test in India? Halty, it's, it, there's five venues that are a little bit off the beaten track. Uh, Hyderabad's the first test. And then, uh, then Visa so Jimmy after that. Jim, Jimmy bowling in that second test match without Stuart. Um, oh, I don't know. Let, let, let's see what happens with uh, Jimmy Anderson. But that combination, uh, 138 test matches together. Uh, over a thousand wickets. Look, I, I just don't think we'll ever see a bowling, com- seam bowling combination, probably a spin bowling combination, uh, ever again like the combination that's just uh, obviously had its uh, last test match at the Oval. Well, we have a very special guest joining us on the uh, Vaughan and Tuffers Cricket Club uh, podcast. None other than England's opening batter. Um, all he does is hit the first ball for four in pretty much every innings that he plays at the minute. Uh, welcome, Zach. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Very well. Um, now, let's get to the, the nitty gritty of this interview. Um, I want you to take me into the dressing room on Monday night. It was it was an interesting one because um, obviously we didn't win the series, but we we just won an epic game. So like there's a lot of we were so happy about the win and like how we played on that final day and to send Brody off in style. Um but obviously we didn't win the ashes, so it was like it was it was it was a great feeling and, and we felt like almost um we'd played the, the better cricket in the back half of the series. So obviously we were on a high as a team, but um it'd been it'd have been, you know, even more special if it was free too. But unfortunately it was kind of like that, um it was slightly less than the celebrations would have been if it if it had been free too, but it was good fun. 
Now, I, I was on the pitch at the end of the game and, and all of you came down the stairs with a little tankard, a little silver tankard. Uh, can you tell me exactly where those tankards were from? Yeah, well, they're from Loch Lomond Golf Club, um, which was, we had a golf trip up there as like a uh, pre-ashes trip, like team bonding. And Collie sorted these tankards out, um, which were, uh, which all had our names on. And, you know, it's a really nice touch. And yeah, everyone, if we, if we win or even after we just, you know, put a beer in the, in the tank and drink out of those, and it's a, it's a nice touch. Uh, and when these uh, tankards were given to you, was there a presentation or were they just left in your bedroom up at Lot Lomond? No, there was a kind of uh, presentation as we, as we arrived and we were given like a goodie bag and, and the tankers were in them. So um, that's a special place. Now, um, a few years ago, I was playing a bit of cricket. And in 2005, we managed to have a similar kind of series. Um, and the celebrations got a little bit leery, shall we say, in 2005. I want you to tell me, in your dressing room on Monday night, who was the Freddie Flintoff in your team? <laughs> There wasn't a Freddie Flintoff, actually. I mean, I haven't seen the pictures of Freddie. Um, it would have taken a lot to be heard to get there a Freddie Flintoff. But <laughs> no, like I say, it was uh, we had a great time. We enjoyed spending char- time together after a you know a hard fought series. Um, but uh, like I say, it was probably a, a bit more muted than your one. Having obviously you just won the Ashes and um, obviously the Aussies retained it. So um, no, there wasn't a Freddie. <laughs> And, and is that true that you didn't um, you didn't have a drink with the Aussies afterwards? Is that right? Yeah, it, it was a shame that the timings just didn't work. Obviously, both teams do a debrief, and you know your ours is usually a bit shorter than it would have been Monday night. But we had Brody leaving, Mo leaving, um, and one of the physios, Griff, was leaving as well. So um, we had our normal debrief plus a send off for those guys. Um, and so we we were just in there in there a bit too long and and didn't quite work for the Aussies. So that, that was a shame. But um, it wasn't anyone's fault. It was just the timing just didn't quite work. And and, and let's just talk that last day. I mean, it was it was remarkable. The atmosphere. Um, obviously, Brody's last day playing. Um, the rain break that came, and then you came back out and and Wokesy produced one of the the most incredible spells. What was said in that rain break? Was there any motivational chats or did anyone? Uh, come up with any tactical genius that allowed you to go out and do what you did in that last session? Not really. I mean, we were all so excited to get out there. When we were rain- when it was raining, we all kind of, I'm in an hour and we're thinking, not again, like after what happened at um, Old Trafford. So when it looked like it was clearing, not a lot had to be said to motivate us, to be honest. You could tell the lads were right up for it. And um, Wokesy just bowled so well all series and, and especially there at the Oval. And um, to get that, breakthrough from Mo was big to kind of give us that momentum and then and then Wokesy got um a couple of quick ones as well and they were just in tandem together but um yeah it was so special when we got those four quick wickets and the crowd they're just incredibly loud um it was one of the most special well it was, it was easily in the top few moments I've had him on a cricket field and yeah it was just um awesome to be a part of it and uh, who, who was the genius that put that older newer ball in the box that you managed to get the older ball swapped for I'm not sure maybe one of the support staff snuck in there and put it in but I mean <laughs> it was um it was a nice touch it was a nice touch for us I mean you get good breaks and bad breaks throughout the series um and you know we've both sides had their share of, of good breaks at times um, and and bad breaks and I, I, it's fair to say that was a, certainly a good break for us and um, it, it, it probably made the difference in the end because the, the the ball we had before wasn't wasn't doing much. Just um, let, let, let's talk Stuart Broad and in, in his last week um, in the dressing room. What was he like in, inside those four walls of the dressing room? He was incredibly calm to be honest. He didn't want too much made of it. He, 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 the way he announced it to us was very calmly, like almost. Um, less so fair, you know, he just, he did an announcement about pig first while he was doing it because he's the chairman of our pig club uh, when we play the football in the morning. Um, and he passed over the reins to Ben Duckett and we thought that was it. And then he said, uh, this is going to be my last game, lads. And um, that was broadly all week to be honest. He didn't want to fuss. Um, he just wanted to crack on, get the win and then we'll worry about that after. And so um, 
he, that's what he wanted. He wanted it to be a, a normal game. We go, I go and beat the Aussies one last time, like he's done so many times before. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, he's just a champion, isn't he? He's just a phenomenal cricketer, especially against Australia. And um, yeah, it'd be it'd be hard boots to fill for sure. He's a, he's a he's a great character and a great bowler. So so let's get this right. On Saturday night, he's called a team meeting to announce something about pig. And then just slips it at the end that he's retiring. That's the first you all knew. No, it was it was in the morning before we got there. We were on the bus. And he said, "I just got an announcement about pig," and it was was it um, it was Saturday morning, Saturday morning, and he said, "Yeah, I just got an announcement about pig." Made the announcement about pig, and then uh, he said, "By the way, lads, this is this is my last game." Um, it's been a pleasure, and uh, and that's how he did it. And that, like I say, that was probably all week. He was. He was so cool about it. He didn't want any fuss and um, just just crack on. And that, that's brought in a nutshell, really. Uh, and that was with the microphone on the bus, was it? No, he just, he just walked up the bus and he said, "Like, make sure we don't go anywhere for warm ups. We'll just uh, we'll just stay in the dressing room." <laughs> and I didn't see it coming at all, to be honest. I was I just thought it was a pig announcement, but um, yeah, and then it it caught me way off guard, and um, yeah, it was it was. It was, you know, a shame at the time because obviously how well he was bowling, I was like, um, you know, wow, I can't believe it. But, um, you know, that's broad. He wants to go out on top and while he's still bowling really well and, you know, I think it's a great way to go out. He'll always be remembered for those last two wickets, won't he? Yeah, and was all the talk was, um, you know, as soon as Australia were eight down, Brody was going to come on. Was that Was that the chat in the team? I don't know to be honest. I mean, Stokes he is pretty good like that. You know, he he, he likes to fill the the crowd with entertainment, and obviously everyone wanted Brody. But I think it was just a, a change that um, he was always going to make uh, the way the ball was swinging and the, and the left hand is in. Um, you know, Brody, you know, could always find that edge, and um, yeah, so it worked out perfectly in the end. Uh, but I'm I'm not sure if that was on purpose or just um, part of it. Always had been the plan, but that's. Stokesy will never will never quite know it's Stokesy. Zach, let's get on to you and your bat. And you've had uh, an incredible series. Uh, how much fun has it been playing in a series that uh, no, it's, it's been talked about as one of the greatest ever Test match series? It must have been great fun. Oh, it was my favourite series I've ever played in for sure. I mean, the Ashes is is definitely different to the rest, and um, with, with no football on as well, it seemed like there's a lot of media attention about it and uh, a lot of hype about it before we before we even started and then to be you know every game going down to the wire it seemed was um, you know it was, it was incredibly special to be a part of and you know I won't forget it Just the, can I tell you back to the first ball of the series you walk out you take guard you're facing one of the great fast bowlers of this era in Pat Cummins just what are you thinking before he's uh, running into bowl well, it was certainly in the back of my mind that I wanted to be positive against the ball, and if it was if it was there to hit, I was gonna I was gonna try and you know get it away because I just thought I'd send a really good message. Um, it wasn't like I was I was I wasn't all in on it. I wasn't like I'm gonna swing at this wherever it is because um, I thought that might have been reckless. But I certainly thought you know if it's in my area somewhere somewhere quite full, I'm gonna try and put my hands through it, and um, and luckily it hit the middle of the bat and. Um, I was pleased. That was kind of the. I wanted to, to make an impression, and you know, wanted to show them that we were going to keep playing the same way. So, I'm I'm, I'm thankful that it came off. And do, do, do you know when you go out to bat, I mean, you play so many aggressive shots early. Do you, do you just have this mindset that you don't fear getting out, and all you're thinking about is scoring runs? I certainly had that mindset uh, a bit more this series, and. Um, I, that was um, the best I've done it this series in terms of my bravery early I just felt like their bowlers I feel like against great bowlers it's actually easier to be braver um, because I you know I felt like if I just sit here against Cummins Hazelwood Stark Boland they, you know, they, there's going to be a good ball in there and um, and I've probably done that too much in my test career against great bowlers um, just kind of allowed them to, to bowl at me and you know there's a ball in there that's probably got your name in it so I thought if I can put them under pressure that might be give me a bit more of a chance against them. So I was, I was certainly braver um, against them and that, and that was on purpose. Um, and, and like I say, the pitches were good early um, in, the, in this series. So it, thankfully it came off on, on a few occasions and I managed to get the side off to a good start. I mean, I mean, the way that you play, I mean, I've watched you so closely in your test career uh, and sometimes, I mean, you've, you've probably not got 
the amount of runs that you would have liked, but I've never watched you and thought you're out of form. You never look out of form. You've got this amazing kind of balance at all times. It's interesting you say that. I've always felt like um, I've always netted well throughout my career and, and I couldn't quite put my finger on why I could net well and then not score runs in the game. There have been times when I've been in the game and felt badly out of Nick. I, I felt out of Nick in, in New Zealand, funny enough, actually in February, the series before this. But it was more just the mental blockage, you know, maybe talking about that earlier, like that, um, that fear of failure too much or not quite think, not quite playing the right game plans against certain types of bowling. But um, I've always felt like I, my, at my best, my game's, my game's good enough. I just couldn't um, quite unlock that for, for long periods of time. So I was thankful I could do that over a series and, and hopefully I can build on that now and, and just try and unlock some of the things that I did. In this and and is there often. a person or uh, a, a group of people or a, a chat that you've had with someone that's managed to uh, get you into this mindset, this series? Certainly Baz and Stokesy uh, have been big on that. And they've been hammering, hammering away at me for, you know, 15 months now about it. Um, and, you know, I feel like this year, after I didn't have a great time in New Zealand and you know, I felt like my place, place was really under pressure. You know, I thought, I, I said to myself, and they would, they, they would, the messaging was always the same from them. And I, I finally decided to maybe fully buy into it a little bit more. Um, and I thought, that was, you know, my best chance of, of success. And so I was certainly, like I said, I was certainly braver in this series than I have been before. And, um, and it's not always going to come off. I think obviously playing that way, there's going to be times when, you're going to get out early and um, and it's going to look reckless. But uh, I think the more I play like that, I, I think better in myself. So, I mean, um, your test crew, there's obviously been um, a huge high in the last seven weeks. Uh, what was the lowest moment? Because, you know, the nature of the beach, playing international sport, cricket, you're going to get questioned and you're going to get challenged. You're going to get people saying that you shouldn't be in the side, you should be dropped. Uh, what, what's been your, your hardest part of your test career so far? There were times last summer where it was tough and, you know, talking about I don't look like I'm out of Nick. I felt really out of Nick at times last summer. Um, and, you know, I felt like my place was under a, a lot of pressure if I if I didn't perform and I was kind of putting too much pressure on myself. Um, and similarly, I felt that in February in, in New Zealand, they were probably the two points where I felt most uh, vulnerable in my place. And... Um, you know, I feel like when I put pressure on myself, I, I perform worse. Uh, and, and someone like Ben Stokes, I mean, I, I, I love watching captains operate because there's, there's no one style that's uh, the right way. There's, there's so many styles uh, that people can be different styles of captains. But I, I, I just love watching Ben Stokes operate. What's, it, what's he like? And, and is he the kind of captain that takes you to one side and there's one-on-one -on -one conversations that he has with all the players? Yeah, he's he's an, obviously an excellent captain. Everyone's seen that tactically as well. Like he does some some things, and you're thinking, oh, I wonder what why he's done that. And a lot of the time, it comes off. And um, you know, he's he's got a great cricket brain, and he's a great communicator. I mean, the way he speaks to the group has probably like surprised me the most about how good he is. Like he he, he communicates so well, and um, I think everyone knows their role so clearly because of him and him and Baz. Like they they. They don't leave any grey area. Everyone knows exactly how they want to play and um, it makes the game a lot more simple for us when we know what's expected of us. And, and you're a group of uh, players and coaching uh, staff that always speak so positively. You can't look back. It's all, always about the day ahead, the future that's uh, coming as well. So is that something that Ben and Baz hammer home into you, that you can't change things that have gone on in the past? It's all about the here and now. He's just, he's just an optimist to his core. I mean, uh, even in Manchester when it was raining, um, and it just it was four o'clock and it was still pouring down outside. He was like, "Don't worry, we'll get out there." And everyone's kind of like looking at him, and you know, I think he's just so positive. And, and Ben, I think Ben feeds off that and leads him to be more positive as well. And we just always look at the upside and what we're doing well. Um, even if we've had a bad day, you don't look at it too deeply. It's like, what did we do well today? Let's do that again. Um, and that's kind of where I was a group, and I think that's why. It comes across like we're quite relaxed at times, but um, I think that's just the positivity and the confidence we have in ourselves. Uh, and the Baz Ball approach, I mean, every time you've been challenged, um, 
you know, I, I remember last summer, oh, can you do it against India? You did that. Oh, can you do it in Pakistan? Well, it worked in Pakistan. Uh, oh, can you do it against the number one team in the world? Well, it's been successful. Um, not won the Ashes, but been very successful against the number one team in the world. The big question now, can it work, work in India against the spinning ball? <laughs> well, only time will tell that. But the one thing is for sure is we'll, we'll certainly play the same way. There wasn't too much spin in Pakistan, so it'll be slightly different to that. But um, it will certainly, we'll certainly play the same way. And I think that's what's so good about the group is we focus on how we're playing rather than um, the results of it. And we, we hope that that takes care of itself in the long run. And um, we'll certainly focus on how we're playing in India and it'll be very similar to, to how we've played in all the other series. And, um, and hopefully it's enough. Uh, and I'm going to finish with the the, the big question. Um, I always say you're a golfing team when you know the cricket gets in the way of your golf. Um, from rankings one to five, you've got to give me the best five golfers in the team, and who's winning all the cash? Who's taking all the dosh? <laughs> um, good question. Am I am I included? Well, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I want to know in the money list in the England dressing room, the golfing team, who's at the top of the money list. <laughs> well, there's a few blokes off dodgy handicaps, so I mean, we'll, we'll go off purely scratch. Um, it would be myself and Jimmy, one, two, depending on the day. Jimmy's a very good golfer. Brookie, narrowly behind. Um, and then it would be maybe Rooty or Baz just behind that, or just behind Brookie. And then you've got a little group around eight handicap who you've got the best, those Stokes, Lawrence, who have I missed here? Collingwood's maybe actually just above Root, just behind Brookie. That's kind of the... Oh, no, sorry, I've forgotten Chiscoffic as well. Chiscoffic could be number one, actually. Left-hander, good player, good player. Good player. Now, um, in my time playing, um, we played a bit of golf and, and Nasser who's saying... Uh, he can't defame me for saying this, but he cheated a little bit. Who, who are the ones that cheat in the uh, the golfing team? Well, Johnny bursto has got a dodgy handicap, um, and he's he's been prone. He's been prone to cheat. Um, I mean, who's a cheat? I think I think I saw Rooty chuck his ball out of the woods once. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. <laughs> he's gonna hate that. I've made I've made that up. But <laughs> um, no, I don't. Well, if anyone got caught cheating, I mean, that'd be a massive steward. So, um, I, I mean, other than Bairstow off his dodgy handicap, I wouldn't say there's many. Uh, Zach, brilliant series. Uh, it's been a pleasure to watch not just you, but the whole team play. You've, uh, I think with the women, this is uh, will go down as one of the, the great uh, English cricket summers. It's been a, an incredible series to watch. And well done. Carry on, Baz Balling at the top of the order. You're entertaining many. Thank you very much. Cheers, Wally. Uh, so, guys, we were talking about what's coming up. We've obviously got the Cricket World Cup in India. England defending champions. But uh, how do you rate their chances of... Uh, holding on to the title in India? Uh, whoever beats them will win. Simple as that. I think whoever beats England wins the World Cup. If it's a semi-final. I think England will get to the semis. Um, India would, would want to avoid England, I would think. In, India are going to be hot favourites on, on home soil, on, on those pitches. But, um, you know, India's way of playing white ball cricket is still a little bit dated. You know, they have a, a number of uh, superstar young players that they could add to this Indian team and almost play a very modern white ball game, but they won't do that. They'll stick with their their team that's been playing for a while. They haven't won a, a major trophy since back in back in India. They, they might have won a Champions Trophy in around 2013, but, you know, a major, major trophy. It's a long time and it was the last uh, World Cup in India, so the pressure will be on the Indian side um, but I just think that this England white ball team is such a powerful unit that whoever beats them uh, will win the World Cup. Nick, what do you reckon between India and England? Yeah, that's a good shout. Uh, England's batting is still incredibly powerful, and they've got power, they've got players to add to that as well. They're not short of guys who can hit the ball out of the park. Uh, they're bowling in Indian conditions. That's probably slightly different. That's perhaps going to be uh, the biggest challenge for them. 
for the test team, they're next. They're actually playing now until uh, the test tour to India. Um, and of course, there was the inevitable question to Ben Stokes. He rolled his eyes yesterday when he was asked, "Will Baz put work in India?" Um, <laughs> I mean, it's going to be. Great to watch, uh, to see that in action. Uh, England will obviously take the attack to India regardless of the pitches prepared uh, and it'll be very interesting to see how India react to that. Um, that's going to be great viewing as well. So there's a lot of, uh, there's some, some great cricket coming up for England and um, and the, we just can't wait for it to happen after watching this Ashes series. Uh, what I'll say about the way England will play in India, they will go and strike it, they'll score quickly and they'll, you know, if they get bowled out in 50 odd overs, they'll have 250, 300 on the books. That's the way that they play. Um, and what they'll do to the Indian batting lineup, I think England's mechanism will be to challenge India's batters with, and I'll use the word, sometimes the Indian players bat quite selfishly for themselves, for their own numbers. And I think in England will use that as, as a, a tool to say, OK, we'll just try and dry up the runs because we know that you're not going to play too many expansive shots because they like their own numbers. You know, they get some big, big numbers. I think the Baz Bullers will play aggressively with the bat and then with the ball, it'll, it'll be about restriction, clever fields, dangling the carrot and trying to play on that on, on that kind of mindset that, you know, Usman Khawaja was brilliant in the series. But there were times in the series where you felt that England were controlling the game when Usman and Marnus were in together because the dots were building and the pressure was starting to develop and the scoreboard wasn't ticking. I think England loved that style of batter. What England don't like is a Mitchell Marsh, Travis Head, that come out and score very similar to like they score. I think they go, oh no, you know, because you know of all the the bowlers in the in the series, Wokes has been a, a standout. Mitchell Stark and, and Pat Cummins have been great as well. Stuart Broad, you know, England's attack going to India, you, you don't look at it and think, oh, they're going to roll India quickly. You know, it's not an attack that you'll blow in India away, but if your batters get off to, you know, the start that we know they can and bat first and the pitch is pure and they smash 400 quickly, I think Ben will work out some mechanisms to put them under pressure by bowling dots and try and force them into the big strokes. Yeah. I mean, the for, for the Test Series in India, you would have thought the batting lineups pretty settled, maybe some question marks over three, depending whether Oli Pope is fit and gets back. Um but the bowling, more question marks. Who do you think they will will pick as their bowling attack? Well, obviously, Jack Leach comes back uh, with his um, yeah. after his back injury. Mo and Ali's reconfirmed his retirement, <laughs> his second retirement. We well, never know, though. Maybe he will uh, sit back in again. Ray and Ahmed, I'm sure, will come into come into things. Will Jacks, who went to to Pakistan, uh, Mark Wood's pace will be needed. Jimmy Anderson, they'll hope to get a couple of tests out of him with his reverse swing skills. Um, probably, as, as Vaughan said earlier, acting as a little bit as de facto bowling coach and in charge of the bowling plans. Ollie Robinson as well. Um, will Chris Wokes be picked? Because there is he, his record overseas. He's not very good, uh, but he's yeah. just won the Compton Miller Medal as man of the series. It'd be odd for them to be left out for the next Test series. Well, I, hard to what I think England will do, and, and, and sometimes when you lose your place in the side, it, it, and, and he's the vice captain, Oli Pope. You know, and Ben Stokes moves to number three, and in India, you you kind of look if you want to get all your spin options in and pack your bat in also. You know, you go Crawley, Duckett, Stokes at three, Root, Brook, Bairstow at six. And then you go Wooljacks at seven, Ahmed at eight. And then you could go Wokes at nine. And then you could have a, a Tonga or a Wood at, at number 10. And then you've got Jack Leach at 11. Now, that's a pretty good bowling team and strength in batting team. Um, you know, if Pope plays, Stokes, he probably bats down at number six. And you might have one less spin option. You know, you will need your spin options in India, unless they, gam- you know, gamble that Joe Root's going to be that kind of uh, off spinner uh, and not play Will Jacks. We'll have to wait and see. But uh, there's loads of different combinations that England could go for. Uh, yeah, Works has got to go. He's got to be, you know, he, he, he's got to see himself now as that that leader of the attack. Brody's out of the way. Um, can it? Can he train himself and skill himself? to be a threat overseas as, as I don't think it'll ever be as much as he is in the UK, but can he, can he take a leaf out? Remember years and years of Jimmy Anderson was being questioned, oh, you can't do it overseas. Well, he's become a brilliant bowler overseas. I just wonder if Chris Wokes can do that and, and, and achieve that over the next two or three years of his career. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Nick. 
And huge thanks to Zach Crawley too. And that's it for the summer. Mike, Phil, Nick and I will be taking a break to get our breath back after that thrilling series. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in over the summer. Whether you're a returning listener or have just discovered us, it's great to have your support. And if you're already missing the ashes, you can check out some of the great interviews on our channel. Previous episodes with the likes of David Warner, Justin Langer and Jack Leach are all available to listen to now. Enjoy the rest of the summer. Fingers crossed the weather improves somewhat and we'll see you all soon. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye.